So far in this series we've touched upon the differences between the first three seasons of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and the Japanese shows on which they were based. We've also taken a brief look at how the rest of the Power Rangers universe panned out, but it's worth noting that with every generation of Power Rangers there was equally another generation of Super Sentai, although granted they didn't really have anything to do with each other. In our last video we looked at how the Mighty Morphin era finally came to an end, and how the producers set up the show for a reboot with Power Rangers Zeo, which is a bit of a departure for me, because I never really watched Power Rangers Zeo back in the day, so I think it's only about right that we dived into this new for 1996 era and see what's what. Now before the series actually started, there was a mini-series of non-canon episodes that plot the arrival of the Machine Empire and the beginning of the Zeo era, but these weren't actually part of the story, they didn't feature the Rangers, and there was over 30 episodes on their own. I use the word episode loosely as they were only very short and they were just add-ons really. But I'm just going to gloss over these because they're not really relevant and they ran alongside season 3 despite it being a completely separate storyline. Besides, we're already looking at over 100 episodes and 3 movies for this video alone, so I hope you're sitting comfortably. At the end of Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers, the Power Rangers had successfully retrieved pieces of the Zeo Crystal, but they were then stolen by Rito and Guldar, right before the command centre was destroyed. The Rangers escaped, but we didn't know the fate of Zordon or Alpha, but thankfully we didn't have to wait too long to find out, as we were soon treated to the next iteration of the show in Power Rangers Zeo. Even the opening credits let you know that this is a continuation of the Mighty Morphin era, with nods to the original music thrown in for good measure. In fact, fairly soon the Rangers even start using the old It's Morphin Time line. It's Morphin Time! 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 It's Morphin Time. It's Morphin Time. See? The series picks up exactly where we left off, with a recap of what happened at the end of Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers. But while Rita and Lord Zed may be celebrating the demise of the Power Rangers, it's all a bit premature, as they're soon left running due to an attack from King Mondo and his Machine Empire, using Serpentira to escape and lay low with Master Vile. King Mondo is joined by his wife, Queen Machina, his son, Prince Sprocket, and a whole army of machine putties called Cogs, as well as a few minions like this apparently Scottish robot that does a hammer throw with another smaller robot to make monsters grow. Meanwhile it turns out that Rito and Goldar actually hadn't stolen the crystal at all. They dropped it on their way out, or something. Incidentally they've now lost their memories, and Goldar's also somehow lost his wings. We don't really know how. And then they become Bulk and Skull's personal servants so that they have somewhere to stay. But anyway, that's all just a bit of a sideshow, really. As Tommy places the Zeo Crystal on the ground, the Rangers fall through a sinkhole to the lower chamber of the Command Centre, which it turns out is actually the location of the new Command Centre, or Power Chamber, and both Alpha and Zordon did survive the explosion. Zordon explains to the Rangers that our solar system is the final link in a chain of galaxies already under King Mondo's control. Luckily, the Zeo Crystal can give them new powers, but with only five subdivisions, it can only give power to five rangers, and there are currently six. As such, Billy decides to give up his powers, at least for now. He can always take up the power later should the situation change, but for now he's confined himself to helping Alpha in the new command center. With their new Zeonizers in hand, the rangers take up their new powers to officially start the Zeo era. In episode 3 we're introduced to the Zeo Zords, but they're a little bit different to the previous Zords. Tanya and Kat are given control of Zords 1 and 2, which control their main arsenal. Rocky is given control of a Sphinx Zord, Adam a Taurus, and Tommy takes command of a Phoenix. Both the Sphinx and the Taurus drive the big guns forward, while the Phoenix patrols from above, and also later releases another weapon called the Defender Wheel. But like with the previous series, the Zords aren't much use on their own, so when all five Zeonizer crystals are combined, the Zords come together to form the Zeo Megazord. This new version of Megazord can also have various forms of power-ups. Like something out of a Wario Land game, a change of helmet gives it different abilities. Green gives the ability to change gravity, yellow gives rocket power, or sometimes referred to as jet power, Pink is for cannon power, blue for pyramid power, whatever that's meant to be, and finally red for warrior mode. 
Throughout the series though, there's loads of additional swords, like the Defender Wheel, as I mentioned, the Warrior Wheel, and the Red Battle Zord, the latter being able to form with Megazord to form the Zeo Mega Battle Zord. Although it requires some form of telepathic control, which means Tommy has to maintain a clear head, otherwise it's impossible to control properly. But it is actually quite a good thing that there are only five rangers to begin with. Billy giving up the power in the US show helped explain where all these new mechs were coming from, seeing as Alpha now had some help in the command center. Both the Zeo Rangers and the O Rangers have a massive arsenal compared to previous iterations. We also learn that the Rangers themselves have their own powers and weapons, like Cat's pink cloud Hadouken thing, and her power disc, a kind of frisbee shield thing. But there's other powers and weapons too, like the blue spinning power punch and the green power hatchet, and loads of others. They're never really explained, and often only really appear once. But all the rangers also have their own individual swords, and then of course there's also the power pods and the Zeo cannon. Honestly, the list just goes on and on. But as we've seen before, rather than just cutting ties with the season before it completely, and just starting everything from scratch, the producers carried on the same narrative trail that had been set up since the start of the entire franchise. And of course we continue to see references to this and previous series as the show goes on, with Tommy having flashbacks in Dino Thunder and the other Zeo Rangers appearing in Super Mega Force, etc, etc. The Equition Rangers keep popping up too, and in Zeo Rangers we first see this in episode 10, where supposedly a computer error at Angel Grove High means that Billy has actually reached enough credits to graduate a year early. Which, to be fair, at the time David Yost was 27 and playing a 16 year old, so it's not like he could pass as a high school student for much longer anyway. Sestro appears needing help to develop a Zeo Blaster to kill a number of monsters that are destroying life on Aquatar, one of which has followed him to Earth. This then leads to Billy leaving the planet so that he can help the Equition Rangers save theirs. It's just a good job he wasn't at school anymore and he also had his parents' permission. I guess it is a kids' show after all. Remember kids, you can always become a superhero, travel to different planets and save the universe, risking your life in battles to the death with monsters and aliens, but if you're going to move to another planet, at least make sure you have permission from school and your parents first. I feel that was a safety message they didn't really need. In episode 14, Billy comes home from Aquatar and returns to his previous role, but towards the end of the series he leaves again. A side effect of his invention to restore his proper age in Mighty Morphin Alien Rangers has actually left him with accelerated ageing, and he eventually has to leave for Aquitar for treatment. He then falls in love with an Aquitian and stays there. The real reason for his leaving, however, was actually because the actor, David Yost, left the show as he was being persecuted for being gay and was almost on the verge of suicide. He hated himself for it and was even going through so-called conversion therapy called Pray the Gay Away which obviously didn't work, and he was also hospitalised and on heavy medication for anxiety and depression. David had no idea about the whole getting old angle and stated that he's never watched the episodes. He simply walked off set one day for what he stated as being called f it one too many times, excuse my language. I have actually met David Yost in real life and I wish I'd known all this beforehand so I could commend him on getting through it. But Kimberly is also written out of the show for good when she writes Tommy a breakup letter, although this is something that comes back around in the transition to Power Rangers Turbo. Well, sort of, but we'll get onto that another time. And anyway, it's basically just an excuse to write in some teenage angst and heartache. But then Kat ends up being his new love interest anyway, and they might actually end up getting married, as hinted in episode 29. But being a Christmas episode, you can't really be sure whether this is really canon or not. In episode 27, we're introduced to the Gold Ranger, although he's actually more like the Black Ranger with a gold shield, a bit like when Zack borrowed the Dragon Shield at the end of season 1. The Gold Ranger has his own Zord, which is basically just a giant pyramid, but this can also join with the other Zords to form the Zeo Ultra Zord. While we don't know the identity of the Gold Ranger yet, it's first hinted as being Billy, as well as also Tommy's brother David, and even Skull at one point. But after being shot down by bounty hunters, the Gold Ranger finds himself on Aquatar, but he can't stay there. We do however learn that he's called Trey of Treforia, and in fact there's actually three of him, because that's what Treforians are. Three separate personalities that are usually joined as one. But his experience on Aquatar has left him split and he can't morph into the Gold Ranger, meaning that a new Gold Ranger must be found. 
but Billy is unable to take on the power, so we see the return of Jason, the original Red Ranger from Season 1. But due to some new monsters from King Mondo being a bit OP, we have, wait for it, another new set of Zords. And by this point we're just running out of superlatives. We had the Zeo Zords, then Megazord, the Mega Battle Zord, the Ultra Zord, and now we have the Super Zords. Oh, and there's also the Super Zeo Megazord, obviously. And then later, the Tray of Wisdom sends the Mighty Warrior Wheel as well. So there's even more Zords than the previous season, and that was already too many. I swear there's just more and more Zords each series. The ones at the start of the season are always better anyway. Although, unlike the previous season, they actually have access to the entire arsenal for the rest of the series. But as King Mondo is destroyed at the end of episode 35, it signals the return of Lord Zed and Rita, albeit in an RV. But they then end up forming a new evil character that's some sort of bomb, called Louis Kaboom. I don't know. That's a bit of a distraction anyway, because we're actually not done introducing new Zords yet, or even done with King Mondo. Tanya receives a key from Aisha, who's apparently still in Africa, and unleashes Oric the Conqueror. And while he only fights for good, Sprocket tricks him into thinking the Rangers are evil. Not that that lasts very long, obviously. And then Tanya is reunited with her parents, who are apparently explorers, even though Tanya's meant to be from a nomadic tribe in Africa, which seemingly lives off the land, and yet she also has the surname Sloan, which wouldn't really make sense because... God, wh wh I don't even know why I'm going into this. We're 38 episodes in, and the end's nowhere near in sight. While Louis Kaboom has assumed control of the Machine Empire, Prince Gasket and his wife Archerina appear to avenge King Mondo and protect Machina and Sprocket whilst also preparing to take control, of course. Archerina is a type of Cupid character, I guess, and so sends Kaboom to do her bidding, and, well, that's the end of him. But by episode 46, King Mondo is back as if nothing ever happened, and footage from the O-Ranger vs Kaku Ranger movie is used for a showdown between the Rangers, King Mondo's monster, and Rita and Lord Zed's monster. The Equation Rangers are also brought back in as well, but this may have actually been an afterthought when having to come up with a storyline to explain Billy's departure. In the final episode, while Rita and Lord Zed are in battle for control, Jason eventually loses the Gold Ranger powers and the return to Trey of Treforia. And then it all gets wrapped up, uh, no pun intended, when King Mondo and his family are blown up by Lord Zed and Rita with a bomb disguised as a present, and then the season just comes to a bit of a lazy end, really. We don't even know what happens to Trey, and he never appears in the next series. The show just sort of ends, it doesn't really wrap things up at all. The transfer to the new series, Power Rangers Turbo, is actually handled by the movie, Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, but it's not really explained very well. The Zeo powers aren't destroyed, and they don't even really appear as the Zeo Rangers themselves. They just take on new powers and new Zords, which compared to the Zeo Zords are a bit of an anti-climax. When I first started this series of videos, I commented on how the original series of Power Rangers didn't really go anywhere. The majority of the season was fairly samey, especially compared to its Japanese counterpart. But Power Rangers Zeo is one of the most overcomplicated and convoluted things I've ever seen in my life. And we haven't even started on the Japanese show yet. I did actually enjoy watching Power Rangers Zeo, I have to admit, more so than I thought I would even. It builds well on the world that was established in the Mighty Morphin era, but the fact that come the end of the season it doesn't really move things along is a bit disappointing. Especially when, while it is part of the narrative that continues on into future series, it just sort of gets dropped when we move into Power Rangers Turbo. Although the Machine Empire does actually pop up again in Power Rangers Wild Force, specifically in the Forever Red crossover, in which the remaining dregs of the Fallen Empire seek revenge for King Mondo. Incidentally, this episode also sees a cameo from Serpentira, as well as the original Red Ranger, the Red Zeo Ranger, and the Red Equition Ranger. Just ignore the fact that they can all breathe on the moon, and there's also gravity, and that Jason calls himself the Red Mighty Morphin Ranger, even though that's not what they call themselves in the show, and that the Red Equition Ranger calls himself the Red Alien Ranger, which is a weird thing to call yourself when you're from Aquatar and humans are all aliens to you. But we're not here to dissect Wild Force. But what most people don't know is that there was also a Power Rangers Zeo comic series. I say series as four issues were originally drawn, but actually only one of these was ever released. It sees King Mondo attacking Master Vile so that he can get his hands on Lord Zed. 
Zed has apparently retained power coins that previously belonged to the Rangers, and offers to give them back, allowing Billy to become a Ranger again, but Master Vile hands them over to King Mondo. We don't know where it goes from there, as the publishers lost the license and the other three issues were never released. But there's also reference to the Zeo Crystal at the beginning of the 2017 Power Rangers movie, albeit very briefly, which you can see in our video in which we break down the film and its graphic novel sequel. So that's what we got in the West. Despite it being a new generation of Power Rangers, the producers actually did a good job of making it feel like it's just the next step in the Rangers' journey after the Mighty Morphin era. In fact, seeing as they were somewhat starting afresh with new Japanese footage, it actually feels more natural than some of the latter parts of the previous season. But I just wish they'd given it a proper ending, and not abandon everything that they'd built up to that point as they go into the next iteration. It just makes it feel like the whole series was sort of self-contained and doesn't really matter. But at this point, we're only halfway there. We haven't even started with the Japanese show. So, are you ready for this? Spoiler alert, there'll probably be some questionable pronunciations here. The show starts by introducing Emperor Bakasundo, which we would know as King Mondo, as well as Empress Hysteria and Prince Borodonto. Bakasundo is plotting the invasion of Earth with his Baranoia army, and a mothership is sent down from their moon base to wreak havoc on Tokyo, destroying buildings and infrastructure as well as attacking people. It's actually pretty epic, to be honest, with Star Wars-like fighter crafts and War of the World-style walkers. We then switch to an Air Force base, where we find out that this has actually already happened in a number of cities around the world. The Emperor is demanding the surrender of Earth, giving up all of its natural resources and putting the entire population into slavery. If Earth is not surrendered, the Baranoia will attack another city every day at noon until there's nothing left. But there is a plan. Four soldiers have been selected to form a special force. Not that we know what that is yet, but we can guess. These soldiers are Yokaichi, Niju, Mita, and Maruo, all of which I probably just butchered with my pronunciations, but it doesn't matter because those are the only time you'll hear those names in the whole series. While clearly pretty handy behind the controls of jet fighters, they're shot down by Baranoia, although somehow still survive. They're pursued on foot by Barrow soldiers, which are seemingly a lot tougher, smarter, and have a greater arsenal than the cogs in Power Rangers. Another jet pilot comes to their rescue in a plane that's seemingly been fitted with some new technology that was developed as part of the O-Ranger program, but that's still nowhere near badass enough for the mid-90s, so he then drops out of a speeding jet on a motorbike and does a ramp jump that causes the bad guys to all start accidentally destroying each other. You don't see Travis Pastrana doing that now, do you? After that, it's time for the first morph, or Choriki Henji, sequence, or at least for the Red Ranger anyway. But while they may have been saved, the war is only just beginning, as the Machine Empire has completed the setup of its operations base on the moon. Now, I don't know if this is a coincidence that Emperor Bacchus Fundo is using a similar set as Bandora from Zoo Ranger did, with a balcony overlooking the Earth from the moon, or whether this was something that was done on purpose to make the transition easier for the American show, but either way it still makes sense in the context of the show, so it doesn't really feel shoehorned in to please the American writers. The would-be rangers are taken to their new headquarters, which has apparently been funded by governments from all over the world, and they're then introduced to Colonel Miura. This is the man that founded the O-Ranger project, and handpicked these soldiers to form the team. He then starts talking about when Pangaea existed over 600 million years ago, and how the continents then split into what we know today. And while we may think that there were no humans on Earth at that time, mainly because there weren't, for the context of the show, there actually were, and the remains of their ancient civilizations can be found deep underground. But some of the humans that existed back then also contained a certain power called Choriki, which the Colonel's team has now managed to recreate, thus why the fifth pilot was able to become the Red Ranger. But with a creature now attacking Tokyo, there's no time to lose. The new rangers must have their body chemistry altered so that they can take on the Choriki power and use their new power suits. The ruins combine together with a pyramid, and we get a power transfer worthy of any superhero origin story. They morph, and then get to work beating up the bad guys with their battle sticks and king blasters. But not only that, we get a proper look at their individual weapons, like the Red Star Riser, Green Square Crusher, the Blue Delta Tonfa, Yellow Twin Baton, and the Pink Circle Defensor. These weapons can all combine to form the Big Bang Buster. All of these names, by the way, being in English, probably because, well, why wouldn't you want something called a Big Bang Buster in your show? 
As the new team is now formed, we drop the surnames and are introduced properly to Goro, Shohei, Yuji, Juri, and Momo. The thing is though, when we get to episode 3, they're back to being pilots. This is something to do with the transformation into O-Ranger taking a toll on their body, so they can only do it when absolutely necessary, I think. But then throughout the early parts of the series, they continue to use planes for dogfights with Baranoia, albeit with added Chiriki cannons. It's almost like Power Rangers meets Top Gun, although it doesn't really last all that long. The show carries on Super Sentai's tradition of monster-based kidnapping, with even a car chase thrown in for good measure. Seriously, after the craziness of Kaku Ranger, and to a lesser extent Power Ranger Zeo, O-Ranger has started off awesome. The Baranoia are after a certain child, although we don't really know why. It's something about him having some knowledge of Chiriki that the enemy may be able to use. It turns out that the boy, who goes by Kenichi, found a small piece of the ruins that also happened to have an inscription which featured part of the equation to make Chiriki power. If Baranoia can catch him, then they may be able to hypnotise him and recover something from his unconscious memory to start the process of replicating the power. Well, I say hypnotise, Baranoia had something slightly different in mind, but thankfully a quick blast from their King smashes and the monster releases him, before the rangers break out the Big Bang Buster again and do away with him for good. This was actually quite an interesting angle, but it's not really brought back up again in the series for some reason. But the child abductions carry on, and it's never really fully explained why. I guess just because it's a kid's show and you want to scare them a little, especially with a monster that can turn them into monsters too, which would probably do the job. In Zoo Ranger, the witch Bandora abducted children to kill them, all because of the pain she has from what happened to her son with the dinosaurs. In Die Ranger, the Gorma abduct children to sacrifice them in a ritual ceremony, and in Kaku Ranger, they're abducted by yokai to be eaten in a restaurant. I feel sorry for 90s Japanese kids, they must have had perpetual nightmares. In one episode, the Baranoia even weaponized babies, but we don't need to go into that. In episode 6, Mira is captured by one of the monsters and interrogated as to where they're developing new machines to help in the fight against Baranoia. Yuji and Momos are the first to be finished, but it's not enough, and eventually with all five completed, the rangers head out in search of Mira, using their storage crystals to form the O-Ranger Robo. The five machines are based on symbols in the ancient civilization's ruins, but also inside the Phoenix is the Giant Roller, the hamster wheel type weapon that we saw in Power Rangers. In episode 8, Acha and Kocha are modified with an enlargement system so that the Barra monsters sent down by the Emperor can grow into giants. This almost leads to the O-Ranger's deaths, but like in the US show, the O-Ranger Robo is able to switch helmets to give different abilities, with the Wing Head or Horn Head that gives the Taurus Thunder Power, a Vulcan Head that gives the Dogu Bazooka, a Cannon Head which has, well, cannons, and a Graviton Head which gives a Lion Beam, whatever that is. But one of the biggest tonal differences between O-Ranger and Power Ranger is probably best seen in episode 15. The story is somewhat mirrored in episode 22 of the US show, but with one main exception. In Power Rangers, a monster called Defector is created from discarded parts of old robots, and used as a trap to lure the rangers into trusting him and then turning its back on them. But in O-Ranger, this robot actually forms itself from discarded parts and is genuinely fighting against Bacchus Fundo. The Emperor scrapped any robot that showed any form of human emotions, like compassion or love, which will come back around later. And this robot, called Barra Revenger, has sworn that Bacchus Fundo is his only enemy. He will not hurt anyone else, but when Baranoia spring an attack and fit him with a device to force him into fighting the O-Rangers, it's up to Yuji to show mercy on him and kill him before he breaks his own vow of honour. It's actually a very sad and emotional ending, with him making the final walk to his own scrap graveyard. We never got anything that emotionally or ethically complicated in Power Rangers Zeo. It's just a robot tricking the Rangers, and then they get revenge. Well, having said that about it being complicated, in episode 17 they then battle the Barra Rangers in a go-kart race, some off-road buggies, a kid's playground, and some paddle boats, so I guess it all balances out in the end. In episode 19, with O-Ranger Robo extensively damaged and looking like it's not repairable, the radar in headquarters picks up a signal of Chiriki power that's coming from outside the base. It turns out that it's a robot called Red Puncher that was being developed long before a Ranger Robo was, but now lays buried. One of the men working on it tried to use it to destroy Baranoia Scouts, but it wasn't finished yet and so he couldn't control it. The Zord went on a rampage that led to the man's death and it being buried in the valley. 
Chief Mira blames himself for what happened and wants the robot to stay buried, but Goro defies him and revives the fallen Red Puncher bot. But, of course, it then doesn't work properly. However, with a little help from the spirit of the young lieutenant that lost his life, Red Puncher is infused with Chiriki power and succumbs to the command of O-Red. Have, uh, have we got time for a 90s aerobics break? Cool, because I've got Mr. Motivator's bums, legs and tums, and I was gonna... What? I'm sorry, what? What just happened? So it turns out that this aerobics break is all part of O-Ranger Robo's recovery, or something. But anyway, once recovered, we learn that Red Puncher and O-Ranger Robo are able to combine to form the Buster O-Ranger Robo. But in episode 23, we go light-hearted again, when the Rangers are all turned into pawns of the Baranoia Empire, and it's up to Jury to become Sexy Rambo to save them all, because... Because Sexy Rambo. It's not until episode 26 that we are introduced to the Sixth Ranger. The pyramid ruins in the command centre begin showing a Riki symbol, and a dimensional shift is detected. Riki is apparently a prehistoric warrior hero from 600 million years ago. He's a protector of the Dorin race, a different form of human that were almost wiped out by the Machine Empire Rebellion. So the ancient civilization chose one of the few remaining Dorin and placed her inside a pyramid-shaped spaceship, along with Riki, and then sent them into another dimension so that they'd be trapped in a time warp and wouldn't age, until the time was right for them to return, of course. When Riki first emerges into the New World, he's completely overwhelmed and doesn't know what to make of it. But he soon realises that the reason for his return is that Bacchus Fundo has also returned after 600 million years. And when he realises he's not the only one that can use Chiriki power, he begins to morph into the King Ranger. See? I always thought it was a bit weird that they called him the Gold Ranger in Power Rangers Zia when it's not really gold. But anyway, like Cole in Die Ranger, Riki is a child, or at least an adolescent, who when morphed is the size of an adult. The Pyramid spaceship that he and Doran use to travel through space and time can also become a Zord called King Pyramida, or Pyramidus in Power Rangers. But it's also here that we learn just why Bacchus Fundo hates Earth so much. It's that 600 million years ago, Baranoia were all but wiped out, and he was the sole survivor. Riki was, at least partly, responsible for Baranoia's demise, and so Bacchus Fundo wants revenge on Riki and to destroy Doran. Also, boob cannons. However, Riki is actually captured and turned into a machine beast, or so we think. In fact, that's not happened at all, he's just entrapped somewhere, and then he's led to safety by Dorin's pet lizard thing called Paku. He calls on the King Pyramida, and it takes on a carrier formation, and then a battle formation, which is capable of producing the Super Legend Beam that destroys the bad guys and saves the day. Although Riki refuses to join the O-Ranger, just agreeing to fight alongside them, so he's not technically the Sixth Ranger at all. In episode 33, the Rangers try to use a Trojan horse attack on Baranoia, claiming that they are to receive a gift from God, which, as per the plan, Bacchus Fundo intercepts with his rebuilt machine beasts. But when he thinks they're just rocks, he orders them to be destroyed, and out pop a new set of Zords. These ones are meant to be individual robots, a little like Red Puncher, but now all the Rangers have one. But then, even though they're meant to be individual robots, these new Blocker robots do actually come together to form the O Blocker. And after a short battle, with the help of a special sword, Bacchus Fundo is completely destroyed. And unlike King Mondo in Power Rangers, there's no miraculous re-emerging, as if nothing ever happened. Although he's not actually gone for good, per se, at least not yet, anyway. But in his absence, a guy called Bomber the Great turns up and assumes command. Although we don't really know where he came from. At least in Power Rangers, they attempt to explain it, with Rita setting off bombs, but it backfiring, producing Louis Kaboom, or something along those lines anyway. But before we get on to that, can we just take a moment to appreciate that the next episode had a robotic skunk called Direct Fart Attack. Or to give it its more formal translation, a direct hit with flatulence. And his farts are so deadly that they need to introduce another new Zord, called Tackle Boy, who turns into a giant bowling ball and blows him up into a giant fart explosion. If that's not enough to tempt you into watching the whole series, I don't know what is. But anyway, we still have more Zords to introduce. Cue episode 37, where a kid called Satoru, who pops up every now and then as a minor character, finds a key and a head-shaped... thing, when hiding near a lake from some bullies. 
Satoru turns the key and unleashes Gunmajin. But unlike Auric the Conqueror, who only fights for good, Gunmajin seems more like a non-magical genie character, doing his new master's bidding, except with an underlying moral code to go along with it. Bomber the Great tries to get Gunmajin to fight for him and steals the key, but Gunmajin then refuses to grant his wish as it goes against what he stands for, so Borodonto then takes the key and attempts to use Gunmajin by wishing to ride in the O blocker. However, Satoru helps him realise that he's been deceived, and after dealing with Borodonto, he and the key then disappear, although that's not the last we'll see of him. In episode 39, Bomber the Great officially takes command of Baranoia after defeating Borodonto in a duel, killing him and sending Hysteria off into space, along with the remains of her son. But it turns out that Bacchus Fundo is still alive, somewhat, as a disembodied head in a jar. We don't actually know how he got there, nor in fact does he, but he is indeed still alive, and he swears to use whatever power he has left to resurrect Borodonto, as although dead, his artificial intelligence chips are still able to function. Meanwhile, Bomber the Great has been using one of his machine beasts to turn everything into gold, including humans and the O-Rangers. The idea is to melt them down and use them for building materials for his grand palace on Earth. That is, until Gunmajin returns to save the day, right before Shohei falls into the smelter. Hysteria then sends her niece, Princess Malatiwa, to Earth, giving her all of her powers. While Bacchus Fundo succeeds in reviving Borodonto, which finally kills the Emperor off for good, Borodonto is not the same little robot that we remember. The remains of his father's powers have transformed him into a grown warrior, which is obviously in contrast to the US show, where both characters are brothers and exist alongside each other. And considering these two new characters are cousins, there's something a little bit cruel intentions going on. Either way, they take back control of the Baranoia throne and cripple Bomber the Great, before fitting him with new weapons and forcing him to lead the attack on Earth. While he is defeated, Malatiwa and Borodonto fire a missile from within him with the aim of blowing up the sun, turning the Earth into a planet that no human could live on. Ignoring the fact that a missile that small couldn't really do anything, or that if it did work, then it would probably destroy the robots too, or maybe even engulf the planet, or just send the Earth floating off into space, because there's no longer the gravity of the sun to keep it in its current orbit. But let's not get too bogged down with facts. There's probably a Brexit joke in there somewhere. Thankfully, the missile never actually reaches the sun, because Gunmajin returns to deflect it. And then... I don't really know where to go with this, but Malatiwa and Borodonto get married as cousins, all the while with the O-Rangers watching the royal wedding on TV as if it were William and Kate. In episode 42, while the Rangers are looking like they're going to be finally defeated, and also publicly executed as well, Dorin defies Riki to unleash a forbidden power contained in a sword that was locked deep inside the King Pyramida. And while it does save them, it also backfires and turns Riki wild. The only way to set him free is for the one creature in this world who is born not to fight, being Dorin, to pray for peace and Riki's release. Hmm, it's a bit too heavy that, really. It's a bit like releasing sin into the world and then using prayer to combat the power it has over people. <sighs> do we, uh, do we have time for another dance break? Sweet. Roll it. <laughs> In episode 45, the O-Ranger headquarters is attacked, and the remaining Zords are stored deep underground. Baranoia starts to take over Tokyo, enslaving people and releasing something called Dark Particles that affects all machines, and also means that the Rangers can't transform. But somehow King Ranger and the King Pyramid are okay, or at least until they too get a blast of Dark Particles. Once again, Dorin prays, and a crystal appears to her that saves King Pyramida and uses the power of Chiriki to destroy the monster that was causing the Dark Particles themselves. Although the Rangers are actually teleported into King Pyramida and then taken to Chiriki's homeworld, where they're then followed too by Dorin, who sort of dies, but not really dies. Although without the power of Chiriki, the Earth does actually begin to die. On the Chiriki homeworld, the Rangers are greeted by the Dorins, while the Darin of Earth is still recovering from what happened in the battle with Borodonto. She tells them that she is unable to return at this point, but the five rangers must combine the power in their hearts if Chiriki is to survive. But when they return to Earth, it's already under Baranoia control. However, there's an underground resistance led by Riki, Miura, and members of the United Air Force. 
While the Rangers think they've only been away for a few hours, they've actually been gone for six months. Plenty of time for Baranoia to build a palace, and also for Malatiawa and Borodonto to make a baby. However, that's meant to work between two robots. When Goro is injured at the hands of Borodonto, the commitment to fight to the bitter end helps return Chiriki power to the Rangers and also to Riki. In a final battle between the O-Ranger and Baranoia leaders, Riki and Miura head to the Baranoia headquarters to retrieve O-Blocker and Red Puncher, as both of which had been locked away when Baranoia took over. They're ambushed on the way, but saved when, once again, Gunma Jin comes to the rescue. So now with O-Ranger Robo, O-Blocker, Red Puncher, Tackle Boy, and King Pyramida all returned, they're able to finally destroy Malatiawa and Burodonto. But as the show ends, it explains that the whole concept of love being what makes humans weak is actually completely wrong. Baranoia claim that, as machines, they are above love, and yet they show love as well. Whether it's romantic love between partners or a mother's love for her child, they seem to be more than capable of showing each other love. Hysteria in particular, as she loves her husband and son, both of whom get destroyed, and then in the end she kills herself, begging the O-Rangers to spare her grandchild. No one is above love, not even machines. And so in that spirit, Gunma Jin adopts Malatiwa and Borodonto's son, promising to raise him as a fine man. Or at least a fine robot. I'm not sure quite how he's going to do that when Gunma Jin is confined to a pot most of the time, but hey, it's a kid's show. With that, Doran returns to Earth, and the season comes to a close. <sighs> well, that was a long one. Now, I made fun of Kaka Ranger and how it was completely out there in its craziness, but O Ranger is just plain awesome. If Kaka Ranger can be described in one word as crazy, then O Ranger can only be described as epic. While Power Ranger Zeo does a great job of building on the world that started with the Mighty Morphin era, O-Ranger is just an extremely well thought out and well put together series, albeit of a particular genre, and even if it is just as complicated and convoluted as its American counterpart, maybe even more so at some points. Power Ranger Zeo actually has more episodes than O-Ranger because it doesn't just use O-Ranger footage, but it uses a lot of bespoke American footage, also mixing in O-Ranger versus Kaka Ranger footage to keep the Equation Rangers going, and also to help explain Billy's departure. It also uses previous villains like Rita, Lord Zed, Gul'dar and Rito, all given their own storylines, and also a more fleshed out story for Bulk and Skull as well, who become junior police officers and then private detectives, even helping save the rangers from Gasket's gladiator pit at one point. So yes, it's completely bonkers and overcomplicated, but for the first time it actually feels like its own thing. Rather than a show crafted around Japanese footage, it feels more like a show enhanced by Japanese footage. But not just that, it's clear that they shot a lot of bespoke footage using props and costumes sent over from Japan, like having Sprocket and Gasket together on the screen at the same time. But even characters like Goldar had completely new costumes produced that were different to those originally used from the Mighty Morphin and Zoo Ranger days. This is probably because by this point the mouth no longer worked the way it was meant to, but still, it's also different from the Goldar suit that was created for the first movie. All Rangers do actually return in two crossovers. The first of which with Kaka Ranger, which we discussed in our first video, although I didn't mention at that point that Gunma Jin also returns, but that's only a brief cameo and he disappears again because he's apparently scared of yokai. Although now that I'm more familiar with the O-Ranger series, this director video movie is obviously either non-canon or it's meant to slot in somewhere in the middle of the series, as the Baranoia's royal family are all as they were in the earlier stages of the series. The second crossover with Gakitsu Sentai Car Ranger somewhat fits the narrative better, or at least the narrative of O-Ranger anyway, as the Rangers come across what is supposedly the last of the Baranoia machine beasts, known as Baromobile. But despite the fact that the Earth was supposedly taken over by Baranoia, the Car Rangers don't seem to have ever heard of them, or of the O-Rangers, and the two don't trust each other, leading to a battle between both sets of Rangers. But as Baromobile begins to try and merge humans with cars to create a race of Car Sapiens, yes, that's what they're called, the two become allies and vow to fight together. Chief Mira turns up to train the Car Rangers, and a mix of the two Rangers arsenals then finally take out the bad guys. There's also a 25th anniversary crossover that tries to tie together a few different series, but again I'm not sure any of these are really canon. And there is also a 35th anniversary set of episodes, but this one needs its own video really. It's quite interesting that O-Ranger partly focuses on pseudoscience, where previously it had been magic or folklore etc. 
Yes, the Rangers still adopt ancient powers, but most of the monsters are robots with advanced AI, rather than clay models brought to life by a witch, or yokai demons, for example. While I have to admit that I enjoyed both series as I was watching them, once you've seen both, you do start to feel that Power Rangers Zeo once again was just shoehorning things into place. Which admittedly makes sense with previous seasons, but with Zeo, there was actually a lot of bespoke footage shot for it, so you feel that they could have done something a bit better. But I think the biggest problem is that throughout the series it did actually feel like a proper continuation of the storyline. Season 3 got a bit stale, especially when they weren't able to use much of the Kaku Ranger footage, but Zeo felt a lot more like the first season did, which obviously is a good thing, but while it had the potential to carry on good storyline, everything just gets dropped at the end of the series, and rather clumsily too. I understand why, but considering the amount of bespoke footage being shot for it, and the money that Power Rangers was bringing in at that point, they could have at least shot a proper blowout ending, rather than just a present bomb and some walking into the sunset. And while the fact that it was followed by a big screen movie, and that it didn't even bother to tie up loose ends, is just unforgivable. I suppose they were hoping we'd just be distracted by boobs. The US producers would have done well to take a risk at this point and start shooting new episodes from scratch, or at least finding a workaround, like with the Zoo 2 footage, as Gakisu Sentai Car Ranger was technically a parody of the Sentai genre anyway, and the US show treating the characters, villains, and the car driving concept as if it was serious just came off as kind of stupid. But alas, I feel that's for another video. So until then, take off Thunder Wings. Scramble, scramble, Hibiku Siren. Take off, take off, Thunder Wing, Kinku Hashi. Oh, Ranger!